Amen. Amen. Wow, I tell you what, I've just been smiling the whole time. <laughs> Seeing you all out here, I haven't seen you in so long. I'm so grateful that we can gather together in corporate worship. And uh, we have done all that we can to follow all the guidelines that the federal government and our state government. And I want to say thank you. I know that all you ladies who fixed up your hair so nice, uh, these masks don't help you much. <laughs> but yeah, I think you look beautiful, so thank you for being here. Uh, I just want to say that if you have any prayer requests, we do have some things that you can uh, fill out your prayer statements there, and you can drop those off at the back of the table uh, at, at the end of the service if you'd like. If you're joining us online, if you have any prayer requests, please uh, send those into the church via email or phone. If you have any needs, you know family members or people who are out of work and their employment, unemployment checks have not come in, we're here to serve and to here to bless. And so uh, if you all here have uh, family members or have needs, let us know that as well so we can bless you. Uh, June is historically our month to help the Nourishing Network. Uh, these uh, children here in Evans who are food deprived and have needs, that's still going on right now. And so as a church, uh, twice a year, we collect items for those students. So there's a list of things uh, in the foyer. If you would grab those on your way out, and over the course of this month, we'd like to be uh, gathering those things to help these children who need meals at home. Also, if you want to uh, consider blessing uh, the church and its work with your giving opportunities. Uh, you can pay your tithe as if you're a member of the church. If you want to give to bless others, I welcome you to do that as well. And you can send those into the church here or pay by your bank online. Those are some of the announcements we go with, and we want to just be a blessing. That's really the key. Uh, a lot of people say, hey, churches just ask for money. Well, we want to be a conduit for blessing. And so if you have, uh, uh, want to be a partner in helping people around the world, uh, we have orphanages, we have schools around the world, we have missionaries around the world, we're launching church plants around the region, and uh, we support a lot of different ministries. And if you want to be partnering with that, please do. Well, let's go into the message today. I want you to know that I have prepared three messages this week. <laughs> Last week, uh, dealing with um, uh, the judgment, the Bema Seat judgment, uh, I wanted to deal with a little uh, topic of what death and destiny looks like. And I got several of your responses last week that said, oh, you're looking forward to that message. So I was feeling pretty guilty that I chose not to go with that message. <laughs> but the events of this week have turned that around. I also alluded to it last week that I was going to be going into a tribulation timeline. A lot of you have asked me about my take on that and the Scripture's take on what it looks like and are we in the end times. And I do want to deal with that. So I thought maybe I'd go into that, but by midweek, after Monday's preparation for death and dying, and after Tuesday's preparation for end time, I realized that the Lord did not want that. And so this is the third message I've prepared this week, so I hope you get something out of it. And in, uh, it's fascinating that it's actually in the text that we would normally be in uh, here in 2 Corinthians. The Lord does that. You know, in October each year I go away and I, and I pray. And I seek the Lord on what He wants us to do and what we want to talk about in the following year. And usually it's a New Testament passage and an Old Testament passage. And we go through that book uh, verse by verse, text by text, and we just get a whole gospel. Well, last October I knew we were going to be in 2 Corinthians. And as we laid out the calendar, this is the Sunday that we were right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through chapter 6, verse 2. It's interesting that this text comes up on this day and in this given week. And so I'd like to welcome you to, to go there. We have uh, titled this entire series is Our Power uh, is Found in Our Weakness. That His power is manifested in us through our weakness. That we don't have to flaunt ourselves or push ourselves or present ourselves in our own energy, but to rely on Him and his grace upon us is strength to walk in this life, and so we find this, this strength uh, by God through our weakness. And today I want to talk about the ministry of reconciliation, what it looks like. This last week, uh, I think it was the other day, I posted on Facebook my take, and I want you to know, church, I clearly said that it was my position uh, regarding these events and not a declaration of our church because we all have diverse thoughts about the events of the last several weeks. I also said it was not a position of our denomination, but my take on it. 
you haven't had a chance to watch that, I welcome you to do so, that you might know where your pastor stands on that, that we are in a season that should have been handled, all the things should have been handled over the course of the last 60 years. It took 100 years for the nation even to deal with civil rights after the freedom of slaves. We can go back to the founding fathers when they even said that in uh, 1780-something, and they said that uh, the African-American was five-eighths of a human being. Fast forward to a civil war fought, and don't tell me otherwise, fought for and, and to end slavery. There were other factors, but that was the primary factor. And we ended it. And the Emancipation Declaration, Declaration took place. It took a hundred years for the country to wake up on the civil rights movements of the mid-60s when I was a kid watching that take place on the television before my eyes. We didn't have social media, but we watched that news. We watched Walter uh, Cronkite speak out, and uh, we witnessed it taking place. We witnessed the assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr., and the riots taking place in Kent State. Some against the Vietnam era, but mostly about what was going on in the civil rights movement. Why has it taken 60 years for another riot to take place? And I'm not for riots, let me be very clear, but for a national declaration of weariness over injustice. We can all say that the injustices that we see are not right, not appropriate, and need to be stopped. We can differ on how to stop them, whether it be legislation, whether it be government leaders taking the point and mandating certain training, whether it be unions and uh, department heads not covering up for faulty individuals, whether it be in the church or in the education field or in the police department or anywhere else. We can talk about all those things, and all are needed. But there is a rise, not just in America, but in the world, that whatever started in our country has got to come to an end. Are we the last bastion on the planet? Good night, South Africa has shifted gears. Are we the last bastion holding on to some taint of our history and still have a feeling that a black man is not a full man, that his concerns are not our concerns? And we grieve, I grieve, for every black American and the fear they have to go through. Now, I'm not speaking to police issues right now. That's not what I'm talking about. But if we don't cry out for the injustice that has taken place, and we've come a long way, but we've got ways to go. And I believe that we as a people of God need to pray and stand for justice, stand for mercy, but walk humbly. Today's message today is about the ministry of reconciliation. I'm going to say a couple of words in light of this text and speaking to you, my dear family who I love, who are here, and I'm so excited. I'm going to speak to my friends and family who are out there watching today, uh, those of you who are in Christ, and those of my friends who are not in Christ. I pray that this message be one that would pierce your heart. Several weeks ago, we spoke about the veil, the veil that needs to be lifted from the hearts and the minds of individuals. And it's interesting today that I'm here talking to you, and our faces are veiled, but I want your minds to be unveiled. I want your hearts to be unveiled to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 11. It says, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Now Paul is trying to defend his ministry. There were the, 12, uh, the 11 disciples that followed Jesus. Judas is out of the picture. They have uh, made a vote, and they brought in another guy, Matthias, and they have the ministry of what they call the disciples. We'll fast track a little bit further, and Paul is knocked off his horse. He was Saul at that point, and God gives him a ministry to the Gentiles, and he is declaring himself and is declared by Christ to be an apostle. Well, a lot of people question that. And they don't see Him in light of the disciples, but He has been given a ministry by Christ just as Christ gave the twelve, those eleven guys, that ministry. So He's defending Himself. 
Word had gotten to the church in Corinth that he, when he was before Festus, he uh, was sound, but he was also moving in the Spirit, and they're, they're questioning his rationale and whether he's really a, a good guy or a bad guy, or whether he's preaching to the Jews or to the Gentiles, and is he abandoning what's going on in all of Judaism. So he's declaring he is a minister of the gospel. And he starts off by saying, this all begins with fear of the Lord. Do you question my fear in the Lord? He says, that's what it starts with. We know that Job 28 and Psalm 111 says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. If we're going to get anywhere in reconciling our hearts to God and with man, it starts with reverence. It starts with fearing the Lord and understanding that He is the judge. Last week we talked about the Bema Seat judgment, that every human being will be judged on every deed, good or bad. Paul jumps right into this, and in light of that judgment, he said, do you not fear the judge? If you sit there and are aware that every action we take, every word we speak is going to be judged by the Almighty, then our hearts will be right to receive what He wants to give us. Now, in several other passages, Paul uses the phrase that says, do we now persuade men, or are we seeking to please uh, men, or are we friends of God? And so, he's declaring that I'm here to please God, but he says here in this text, look, we're here working to persuade you. Yes, but we're trying to persuade you honoring God. In fact, the work that we do when we're trying to talk to others is to honor God. See, our whole, ju- our whole justification for being here, our own whole reason for being here as the people of God is to minister to those who are not part of the people of God, to point to Jesus and to be ambassador of Jesus. So, yes, I'm here to persuade you. I'm here to persuade you that Christ is the way. Because if I don't live my life that way, I'm not living the way Christ wants me to live. Now, verses 12 through 13 says, we are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God, and if we are in our right mind, it is for you. Paul is calling on these people, says, have I not done something for you? Have I not ministered to you? Have I not been there for you? Paul content, compels them to hear him, even though other people are slandering him. He wants them to understand that if he's out of his mind, he's out of, the mind, out of his mind for God. He wants to be completely in line with what God wants him to do. And if it looks foolish to them, they need to know why. He's going to behave the way God wants him to behave. One uh, theologian said, in light of this, Paul saying, you have been converted unto my labors. You profess to regard me as your spiritual father and friend. And he says, I have no reason to doubt of your attachment to me. I want to step alongside of Paul for a moment, and I want to speak to you. I've been privileged to be your pastor for 14 years. We merged about 10 years ago with Pastor John with Aspirants. I'm so glad, brother, you guys are here. Love you. We walked together for 10 years and 14 with the Olympic group. But I also want to speak to those out there who were part of the ministry at the Anchor Church for 10 years and those who were underneath my youth ministry for 12 years at Bothell First Baptist Church. Many of you are my Timothys. In fact, those of you I'm speaking to you from Botha First Baptist, I speak to you now. You were underneath my teaching. You gave your heart to the Lord under my instruction. I baptized you. I did the counseling for you and your weddings. I dedicated your children. Many of you call me your spiritual father. Those of the anchor, I did so many weddings for you. I've counseled you. I've loved you. You've come to me. You're still calling me from around the country to get my spiritual counsel. To those of you in Edmonds right here, downtown as I'm walking around, you come to me and you sought spiritual advice from me. So I partner with Paul in this moment and say, I have had any spiritual voice in your heart. I want you to hear me today. I want you to hear me today. And if I'm foolish, I'm foolish. 
If you're weary of me, you're weary of me. But I'm speaking to you if I have had any, any message to your heart. I want you to hear me today in this time and in this season. That's what Paul's saying. If he's done anything in the ministry, listen to him. And he says this in verses 14 through 15. For Christ's love compels us. We are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. If you call yourself by the name of Christ, if you claim to be a Christ follower and a Christian, if you do not, do not live your life dead unto yourself and alive in Christ, you are not walking by the Spirit. If I had chips that I earned, if there was a debt to be paid because of my life service to you, I'm calling those chips today. If you call Christ your Savior, you must abandon the ways of the world and take on the mantle of Christ once again, because you are dead to self, you are dead to sin, and you are alive in Christ. My heart is breaking to see those who I know claim Jesus speak vile and malicious words to their brothers and sisters. My heart grieves that you who gave your heart to Christ and walked in the Spirit so many years ago have abandoned the things of the Spirit to take on the mantle of this world's mindset and the rage and the malice and the viciousness towards your brothers and sisters and to this situation going on out there. You see, you want to hear about the Antichrist? There are many antichrists. There's one major antichrist coming, but the word antichrist means other than Christ. And today I see in the church of Jesus many people who are following other than Christ. And that's the spirit of antichrist. So I'm calling you to die to self. Die to the world. Once again rise up as a new creation that you are and walk in Christ. Your life belongs to Jesus. Your voice belongs to Jesus. Your attitudes belong to the Lord. Your actions belong to the Lord. They are not yours to give freely. They are His lived out through you. Look at verses 16 through 17. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Please let that sink in. Let the veil of your heart be lifted. Let your eyes read that and your life change. You're not to regard anybody from a worldly point of view. Though we once regard Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Now look, some outside of Christ want to see Christ as a teacher. He's one of many ways to heaven. He might be a prophet. They might see him in light of a religious class they took. He's just kind of on an outside situation, and I can assess the teachings of Jesus. Well, maybe you were that way one time too, but you're not that way anymore if you've come to Christ. He's your Savior. He's your bride. He's your Lord. He's the shepherd. He's the head of the church. And so, we, if we are in Christ, need to live as a new creation and let that worldly view, that old man, die. I'm not going to speak to you as a non-believer. I'm speaking to you who are here today as my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not going to speak to you who've given your heart to Christ out there and you say you're Christ followers as a non-believer. I'm speaking to you as a brother and sister in Christ. Here it is. I'm calling out to your hearts to see your words and actions and check them that they are not contrary to the nature of Jesus. 
that they're not contrary to the Word of God, that they're not contrary to the heart of God. You need to pause. We're going to come before the Lord's table today. Paul says that we're to examine our hearts to see if there's anything that's wrong in us. I'm asking you all to pause and see if your attitudes, your actions, your words have been slipping into a worldly view and not being functioning as Christ would have us to do. Behave like a child of God. When I sent my children off, some, one Brandon went to India, he went to Finland, Brittany traveled uh, to the south, uh, to uh, uh, Mexico and missions and different places and traveled to see people. I'd always say, listen, you represent God, you represent your name, and you represent my name. Don't shame me. We've gotten words from people in Finland and elsewhere. We're so proud of our kids that they would write, people would write us and say how gracious my children were. That makes a papa proud. <laughs> You're, you and I are children of God. We need to make our papa proud. But right now, many of us are shaming the name of Jesus by our actions. I grow weary. Aren't you weary of the rage that's in our world today? It says here in verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave you a ministry. He gave me a ministry. It's not one of division. It's not one of argument. It's not one of malice. It's not one of slander. It's not one of separation. It's one of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. I have witnessed over a week and a half Christian brothers calling out other Christian brothers, calling them sinners. Your words, your position are against God. And the way they're doing it, no matter what the position is, and right and wrong, let me just tell you, we can do better. We're not behaving like Jesus' kids and brothers and sisters. God is using us. Sometimes I think we've allowed our connection and relationship to God to slip. Sometimes I think those who even love the Lord have somehow slipped into a place where it's an add-on to our life rather than a transformation of our life. It's like clothing we wear and we take off when we have our own thoughts. And yet the Lord has said, listen, you're only alive in Christ. And I looked at you and I said, you don't have, I take away your sin because Christ paid that price. And I don't want to judge your sins, but I'm going to forgive you your sins. And we are given a ministry to tell others, God is here to forgive your sins. Be reconciled with God. We've lost that message. We're talking about everything, but not that message. We're a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we don't talk about the gospel that God wants to pull men to Himself and redeem them of their sin and that they might repent before Him and come to Him. And even those who walk in the name of Christ who are living in a selfish and worldly way, it's time to repent. Be reconciled with God. Take up your ministry of reconciliation. Look at these great verses in 19 and 20. It says, and He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
God is trying to make His appeal to humanity through you. He went to the cross, that's sufficient. Now it's in your hands. Appeal to humanity on God's behalf to be reconciled. This idea of an ambassador, I've been fascinated with this, and every country has their own uh, rules and regulations on being an ambassador, but our country has some rules and regulations for being an ambassador. Obviously, there's a certain, there's not even really much of an age restriction. Some, but you know, as president, you have to be 35. There's not much of an age restriction. 18, I believe, you have to be a citizen. But you're appointed. You're appointed by a president to represent our country and represent the policies of our country. Now, you don't have to agree with them, but you're probably not going to be appointed by a president unless you agree with their take on it. Sometimes we have ambassadors that go against the president's policy, no matter what president it was. But the message of the work of an ambassador is to represent the king and represent the kingdom. So as an ambassador of Christ, we represent Christ and His message. Every one of us in Christ are ambassador. Now, are we a bad ambassador? Or are we a good ambassador? If our message is anything other than re reconciliation to God, then we're a bad ambassador. If we're sidelining other little conversations here and there as being the preeminent message of the gospel because we're Christians and this is our, our platform and it's not Christ's platform, we're a bad ambassador. If we don't live like Jesus, talk like Jesus, behave like Jesus, we're bad ambassadors. I'm calling for all who claim Jesus as their Lord to stop the behavior that is a bad representation of Jesus. It, it takes your heart to be stirred. The sidelines are not in where you need to be. Some place of silence over here just waiting to see how things play out is not where you need to be. At the same time, you don't need to be drawing a line in the sand among people hating them or despising them for their positions, but bringing up the heart of God to restore humanity into a relationship with Himself. There's our message. It's the biggest shift in your life that must take place, that this is no longer your life. It's His life. It's Him in you. You don't get to live the way you want to live anymore. Verse 22 gives us a clarity about what this message is. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Not just behave like the righteousness of God, not to look resemble the righteousness of God, not to be show and tell, look at the righteousness of God, to become. That means you are. Everything in you is the righteousness of God. Why? Not because of anything you or I have done. We're sinners. We'll be judged for good and bad except for the fact that Jesus, who is perfect, the perfect God, the perfect man, He Himself came down and He became sin on the cross for us, and He bore your sin and He bore my sin. He forgave me, and I am the chief of sinners. Oh, what He has forgiven in my life. I'm so humbled by and grateful for. He became my sin. Not that I can pretend, not that I could push it off and not behave in such a way, but that I become righteous, right standing, 
standing in the right place before God and in the right place and positions before man. There's the, there's the weight of it. Christ on the cross so that we might be who we're called to be. And if we do not become and be who we're called to be, what shame do we put on the cross of Christ? It's the ministry of reconciliation and representation and righteousness. The last two verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, calls you and I as co-workers. It says, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For He says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Who's Paul talking to here? He's talking to the saved people in the church of Corinth. And I'm talking to my saved friends, myself and you, and all who are watching. We're God's co-workers. You have not been furloughed from that job. You are not unemployed right now. You're on the job every day as a co-worker to be an ambassador of righteousness. If ever there was a time when mankind needs the presence of Christ, it's now. You see, you are the light. You are the salt. You are the priests. You are the warriors. You are the ambassadors. You Chronicles 7 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, repent, turn from their evil, wicked ways, call to heaven, I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. If my people called by my name, you call yourself a Christian, then I'm talking to you, would humble themselves. And pray and turn from our wicked ways. Then he's going to hear. Then he's going to forgive. And then he will heal our land. Today is the day of salvation. It's a day for the saints to declare, I will be a witness for Christ. And it's a day for those who I've talked to many times and you've not made a decision for Christ to hear the message that your sin can be forgiven and you can be in a relationship with God. You can have that judgment deferred and forgiven so that you might be called a child of God and have that ministry as well. All things forgiven. Today's that day. Let's be workers towards that. Would you pray with me? God, help us not to forget and take lightly the sacrifice of Christ. Help us not to marginalize the message of salvation that is needed in this world. When the love of many is wax cold and brother is against brother, and evil is said to be good, and good is said to be evil. It's upside down, Lord, and I pray that the church that you have called your bride, that takes up your name, would walk in holiness, Lord God. May our garments be white and not tainted by this world. May we be dead to ourselves and alive in you, speaking out your message, the good news of salvation. Forgive us, Lord for attitudes and actions and words 
behaviors. Forgive us, Lord. Renew in us a, a new heart. Change our hearts. Shift us, transform us. Give us strength in your spirit to be the righteousness of God before men. May we love, do justice. May we love mercy. May we walk humbly. In Jesus' name, amen.